In the early morning hours on June 3rd of 1999, a 23-year-old stock clerk was working the graveyard shift at a supermarket in Las Vegas. At about 5 a.m., a crazed gunman came inside of the store and murdered multiple people, attempting to also murder this stock clerk. But he played dead and narrowly managed to escape. This is the sickening case of Zane Lloyd. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also lawn mowing. You can hire me for 20 for the front and an extra 15 for the back. Nice discount. But today, we're going over the case of a deranged man named Zane Floyd. You're going to learn about a twisted tale of someone who decided to randomly snap. For our story, we're headed to Las Vegas, Nevada. In 1999, exactly 418,658 people lived here, but as we all know, Las Vegas is famous for its party scene, and what happens there stays there. Except for this story that we're talking about. But Las Vegas was settled in 1905 and officially incorporated in 1911. Known for its casinos and bright lights, there's so many things to do here. You could visit the Fremont Street Experience where there's free live music every night. If you're interested in crime, I mean, you are watching me, you could go to the Mob Museum and see and learn some really interesting things. You could go to a place called Area 15 and enter an alternate reality. I think that sounds rad. But unfortunately, as you all know, None of those reasons are why we're in Las Vegas today. Zane Michael Floyd was born on September 20th of 1975 in Esses Park, Colorado to Valerie Floyd and James Cobus. James, like many other deadbeat fathers, left before Zane was even born. When he was born, he was six weeks premature, weighing less than five pounds, and he had underdeveloped lungs and suffered from undiagnosed FASD or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. He was in an incubator for five days after being taken by helicopter to a nearby children's hospital in Denver. His mother, Valerie, had lost her first son to sudden infant death syndrome when he was only three months old. This caused her to go on a downward spiral and while she was pregnant with Zane, she did drugs, smoked some green, and also drank alcohol. Valerie met a guy named Michael Floyd when Zane was about three years old, and they hit it off well and would go on to get married. Zane didn't begin talking until about three to four years old, and he suffered severe motor skill and concentration problems. And his family started to move houses constantly, so that didn't help. By the time that Zane was able to go to school, he was severely delayed developmentally. He was behind in talking and walking, and he was held back in the second grade. This was also around the time that his stepfather Michael adopted him. It was recommended to Michael that Zane be put into special education classes, but Michael refused and insisted that Zane stay in standard education classes, and so he did. The reason that the family was moving houses so much is because the stepfather Michael had enlisted in the Navy. First, they went to Connecticut, then to Virginia, then they went to South Carolina, and then some kind of injury ended Michael's Navy career. After this, the family would move to California, and it was here that Valerie and Zane spent many hours together gardening. Zane, as a child, played baseball, and was a very joyful boy who was smiling all the time. In 1988, Michael received a business opportunity he couldn't refuse. The only catch was that him and his family had to move to Las Vegas. Figuring this might be a great idea, the family packed their bags and moved to Nevada. Shortly after this, Zane was brought to a child psychiatrist and diagnosed with ADHD and prescribed Ritalin. The reason for this is because Valerie and Michael were starting to recognize problems in Zane. 
He wasn't violent or anything, but he oftentimes disturbed class. By the time that Zane was in middle school, he was still prescribed Ritalin, but it didn't work, and so he was then prescribed antidepressants and was constantly getting into fights, had behavior problems, and he started lying a lot. He was also still playing baseball and a good athlete. Zane became best friends with a guy named Robert or Jay Hall around this time, and it wasn't long before the two of them would start drinking heavily. His stepfather, Michael, was also abusive towards him and his mother, and one time, Michael even went to jail for it. A few years would pass, and by the time that Zane was 16 and in high school, he began doing methamphetamines and regularly smoking some green. He was stealing from stores and collecting knives. He wasn't very popular in high school, and his friend group was just kind of there. They weren't outcast, but they just blended into the crowd. Zane had long hair, loved wearing Metallica t-shirts, combat boots, and jeans, and he also drove a Mustang. While on a school bus, though, he got into a fight and was suspected of doing drugs, and so he was expelled. After this, he enrolled at Faith Lutheran High School, which was a private school in Las Vegas. It was here that he started to improve his grades, and his baseball coach said that Zane started to mature and even helped the team be successful. Unfortunately, this was only temporary, and Zane fell right back into his bad habit of doing drugs and drinking. At 18 years old, he was a high school junior and ended up returning to public school to try and graduate. Deciding that that life just wasn't for him, he then dropped out of school. Without much direction on where he wanted to go, and knowing that his biological grandfather and stepfather both were in the Navy, Zane had an interest in the military and decided to follow through with it. In 1994, he enrolled in the Marine Corps and lost 62 pounds in basic training and was soon deployed to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Here, he saw a lot of people die, and this really had an impact on him. Zane also still had his issues with substance abuse, and so in Cuba, alcohol was very cheap. He ended up being reported one time for drinking while on duty. Zane earned a lot of commendations and medals while he was in the Marines, and in 1996, he left Guantanamo Bay and went to Camp Pendleton, located in Southern California, a much easier location to be at, and it was here that he was considered to be one of, if not the best, instructors in his unit, even though he was the youngest. In 1997, Zane started to attempt to meet his biological father, James, but James didn't want to. This left Zane feeling unwanted and depressed. A few weeks later, he was arrested while intoxicated, and this too was reported to the military. In July of 1998, Zane left the Marine Corps with an honorable discharge, but they told him not to re-enlist. He ended up moving home to Las Vegas, and he had a really tough time trying to get back to normal. He enrolled at a community college in Southern Nevada and took two classes during the fall semester of 1998. But by the end of the semester, he withdrew from one of the classes. By now, him and his best friend, Robert Hall, began using meth again and moved in together. Sometimes Zane would go for days without sleep as the two of them partied and used drugs. But after he had gotten out of the military, his friends and family noticed a pretty big change in his behavior. He became increasingly more introverted and started talking all the time about guns. In January of 1999, he decided to purchase a shotgun. Zane also started working as a bouncer on Tuesday nights at a place called Sneakers Bar, and he was also working as a security guard at another bar called Timbers. While working as a bouncer or security guard, he was armed carrying a 32 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Zane became really close with some of the other bouncers at Sneakers, specifically the head bouncer, Kenneth Asensio. These two and another bouncer, Tony Marquez, hung out pretty much every day. They would go to a shooting range, hang out at bars, go see movies. Kenneth considered all of them best friends and from his point of view, nothing was wrong with Zane. He was a completely normal and soft-spoken guy. 
But by the weeks leading up to June of 1999, he really started to spiral out of control. In May, Zane told people he quit his job at Timber's Bar because he was being underpaid and $7 wasn't enough. In reality, though, Zane was fired from this job and the reasoning isn't known. The head bouncer at his other job, Kenneth Asensio, was leaving sneakers in a few weeks and Zane was set to become the head manager. Sometime during this month, or May, one of Zane's cousins was killed by a drunk driver and this was devastating to him and his family. Zane had lost multiple people in his family due to car accidents and so he was very cautious while driving. By the end of May, he got kicked out of his apartment and he was allowed to move to a guest house that was located on his parents' property. Around this time, he also began dating a woman named Pauline Adamo. There's really not much information about her or their relationship though, because it lasted for about three weeks. On Tuesday, June 1st of 1999, everything appeared to be normal. Zane had worked just like every other Tuesday and seemed to be in good spirits. On Wednesday, June 2nd, Zane had played some basketball, picked up his final paycheck from his security guard job, and then went to his job at Sneakers where he sat at a booth and ordered a few Coca-Colas. He wasn't working, but he stayed here for about an hour or so, watched some baseball, and also made about four to five phone calls. Whoever he was trying to reach wasn't answering, and so he became visibly frustrated about this. He ended up leaving Sneakers and met up with his girlfriend, Pauline Adamo, and they went to a local strip club where Pauline was going to get together with some friends for a bachelorette party. When Zane opened up his paycheck, he became frustrated because they apparently didn't pay him as much as they were supposed to. At this strip club, he started to drink a lot and had eight double shots of Jack Daniels and a few beers. After Zane and Paulina were done here, they weren't done partying, and so they went to a hotel that was showing a disco band called the Boogie Nights. They were gonna dance. A bit after they got there, Zane left Paulina to go play some blackjack in the casino. When she found him, they got into a big argument because he wanted to stay and she wanted to leave, and so she decided to leave him there. Zane then spent the rest of his paycheck gambling, but he made sure to keep enough money for a taxi home. And by the time he got home, he finally had enough. When he went inside his house at about 3 a.m. on June 3rd of 1999, he was feeling like a loser and was tearing things apart. I'm not sure exactly when, but Zane decided to shave his head. A question then popped into his head and that one was wondering what it would be like to shoot somebody. Next, he decided to call an escort service, who typically would send dancers to people's private parties, or homes, or whatever, and told them he had $700 and wanted a young woman to come to his home. That amount of money normally meant that whoever was paying for this was interested in more than just dancing. But in reality, Zane was broke and only had $7 to his name. At about 4 a.m. though, a woman named Tracy went to his house after she already completed a job prior in the day and she was off some methamphetamines. She had no idea who she was about to come face to face with and the dangers that lurked behind that door. When Tracy arrived to Zane's house, he grabbed her and pulled her through the door and had a shotgun pointed at her face. This shotgun was the one that Zane previously bought, and he also modified it. Tracy, scared as ever, asks why he's doing this, and he told her because it's his sick little fantasy, and that he wants to know what it's like to kill, and he needs her help. She tried to calm him down, but this didn't do much, and for the next hour or so, he took advantage of her. I won't go into exact detail, but what he did is sickening. So after that happened, Zane started talking to Tracy a little bit deeper about his plan. He got dressed wearing his Marine Corps camouflage shirt and pants and put some combat boots on. He said to Tracy that killing was the reason he entered the military and that he had 19 rounds ready to go to kill the first 19 people he saw. 
Zayn then ejected a live shell from the shotgun and said that Tracy's name was on it and he was going to kill her. But instead, he decided to fire five warning shots and give her a 60 second head start to either run away or be killed. At about 5 a.m., she ran away and ran to a nearby telephone to call the police. Zane, dressed in his full military gear, put a bathrobe over his shotgun and began walking to a nearby grocery store about 15 minutes away. He figured that he'd be able to find 19 people here. He decided on a store called Albertsons, and inside there was about 30 people, some workers, some customers, and some vendors. The most notable of these are Thomas Darnell, who was a 40-year-old mentally disabled man who worked as a courtesy clerk. Chuck Leos was 41 years old and nicknamed Chuckles by some of his co-workers, and he was the store manager at the time. Dennis Sargent was there at the time, and he was the night supervisor and 31 years old. Zach Emenegger was 21 years old and a stock clerk. Lucille Tarantino was 60 years old, working in the back near the bakery. But anyways, on this cold and windy morning, at 5.13 a.m., Zane had arrived to the grocery store and had one thought in mind. He was wondering what it was going to be like to kill somebody. Upon entering the store, the first person that he saw was Thomas Darnell, who was bringing shopping carts into the store. Zane shot him twice in the back and continued on his rampage. His thought process was to go through the store and kill everyone he encountered. Immediately, the people in the store began to panic and run anywhere they could, some escaping. Next, Zane saw Chuck Leos and Dennis Sargent, and he killed both of them. Zach Emenegger was working in the back when he heard the gunshots. He looked down an aisle and saw Chuck Leos on the ground covered in blood. Zach was shocked in this moment as it didn't really click in his head what was going on. He started walking backwards and this is where he found himself in the produce department. One of the workers who waxes the floors ran right past him and right then Zach knew something was wrong. He then kept walking backwards to go to the back room and it was at this moment that he realized he just made the biggest mistake of his life. Coming around the corner was Zane Floyd with his shotgun loaded and ready. Zane then attempted to kill Zach and start shooting at him, chasing him around. You can see Zach really trying his hardest to get away, but he wasn't able to and was shot. Zane turned and saw that Zach was still moving, and so he went over to him to shoot him again. Zack knew that there was only one way he was going to survive because Zane wasn't going to stop until he was dead. After being shot again, Zack decided to jerk his whole body and lay back playing dead. Thinking that this is the end of him, he just prayed and wished. Zane walked up to Zack, looked at his body and said, yeah, you're dead. Zack thought to himself, God, if you're going to take me, take me now. Zane then continued his terror and found Lucy Tarantino. He said to her, Hi, how are you? Lucy said, Oh my God, and then Zane shot her in the head. Christine Goldsworthy, a bookkeeper, was in an elevated office in the front of the store when she called 911 at 5.16 a.m., only three minutes after the shooting began. In the store, Zach was holding on by a thread, but Zane was still running around. Something told Zach not to move, and luckily for that intuition, it possibly saved his life. Zane came back over to the produce department and went back over to Zach. He leaned over him to make sure he was dead, and Zach stayed as motionless as possible with his eyes closed. Zane thought he was, and so he walked away. At 5.19 a.m., the police arrived to the store. Zach didn't know they arrived, and after Zane walked away, he decided to try and go get help. He got up to go to the back room to use the phone, but he realized that after being shot twice, he's barely able to walk, so he fell down. Zane was very close by and miraculously didn't see Zach. At 5.20 a.m., Zane decided to walk out of the store, and to his surprise, there were cops everywhere holding him at gunpoint. After eight minutes, he decided to surrender because he couldn't take his own life, 
and wasn't willing to point his gun at the cops because he respected them and at one point in time wanted to be one. He was then arrested and taken into the police station and now an entire town was not only shocked but devastated. Zane said while he was speaking with police at the scene of the crime, why did I kill those people? Why did I kill those people? I, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. I just, I just started shooting and I just kept shooting. The tragic loss of life at the hands of a deranged man for no reason at all. When police talked to Zane afterwards and took his alcohol levels, they found out he was above the legal limit. He also told them he took meth beforehand, but they did blood tests and found no traces of that. On July 13th of 2000, almost a year after this all happened, Zane's trial would conclude and he was sentenced to death on four counts and ordered restitution totaling a bit more than $180,000. Zane said to the families of his victims that he's sorry and he can't tell them why he did it, but it wasn't for fun, that he can't take back what he did and if he could, he would. He eventually would meet with a psychologist named Edward Doherty. Edward said that Zane suffers from mixed personality disorder, borderline, paranoid, and depressive features. He also said that this was heightened by Zane's long history of alcohol and drug use, and that on the morning of the shootings, he had a psychotic break. So since 2000, Zane and his attorneys have been trying to get him off the death penalty and spare his life. He was eventually scheduled to be executed on July 26th of 2021. That was almost two years ago, so you're probably wondering, well, what happened with that? Did he get executed? No. No, he didn't. In April of 2021, Zane decided to challenge Nevada's use of lethal injection, claiming it's cruel and unusual, and if they put him to death, he would prefer the use of a firing squad, so his execution was delayed until February 28th of 2022. About 10 months later, on February 14th of 2022, it was delayed again because the Clark County prosecutors didn't obtain the federal death warrant needed in time to carry it out. The latest update is from April 13th of 2023, and basically, it's the same thing that we just talked about. How the lethal injection is being challenged in court for being too cruel and unusual. Zane's lawyers claim that he doesn't want to die, and that this was all caused from an undiagnosed case of fetal alcohol syndrome brought on by his mother. Potentially, that was an issue, but Zane was found to be of a sane mind and aware of what was going on. He murdered those innocent people in cold blood for literally no reason. He doesn't want to die, and I'm sure that the people he killed didn't want to die either. An eye for an eye is the way that I see it. But whatever happens, at least he'll be rotting away. Thomas Darnell was 40 years old and just a very nice guy. His life was incredibly hard. At five months old, he developed meningitis, which really affected his development. Sometime during his teen years, his whole entire family was held hostage for seven hours at their home. These people ended up kidnapping Thomas and held him hostage for over 30 days. They released him into the Utah desert after a failed attempt of cutting off his ears. Not long after that, when he was 14, his father was murdered, and while he was a child, he went to 16 different schools. Thomas was an extremely unique person who loved to help people, he volunteered at the hospital to help veterans, volunteered at an elementary school to tutor children in math, and he would help elderly women carry their groceries to their cars at the grocery store. Thomas's mother, Mona Nall, said that Thomas didn't have a lot to give, but he'd give you everything he had. Dennis Troy Sargent was 31 years old and a husband and a father to a seven-year-old named Cody. Cody would write messages on helium balloons whenever he wanted to talk to Dennis. Dennis taught him how to tie his shoes, brush his teeth, started him a stock portfolio, and he read to him every night from the world-class book of virtues. In Cody's eyes, his father Dennis was the strongest man on earth and invincible, and that after losing him, whenever someone else would walk out of the front door, he had no faith they were coming home. Instead of asking when he'd get his next toy or next Pokemon, Cody would ask his mother, Brenda, where he's going to live when she dies. So sad, but Dennis was a great father and husband. 
Carlos Chuck Leos was 41 years old and just celebrated his wedding anniversary to his wife, Leanna Parkey Leos, only four days before this happened. Chuck was a good-natured guy, and he asked Leanna to marry him on Halloween while she was wearing a clown costume. On the morning of July 3rd of 1999, Chuck was supposed to call Leanna at 6.30 a.m. to wake her up, but her phone rang at 6 a.m. with the most devastating news she's ever heard. Lucille or Lucy Tarantino was 60 years old, and she was a church-going lady who was fun, funny, opinionated, well-read, artistic, and a hard worker. It's very upsetting to know what these people went through and what their families had to go through. I really hope that they're all resting peacefully wherever they are. Zachary Emmenegger survived after being shot twice and having multiple surgeries. He faced Zane directly in court and told him how he felt to his face, and Zane just looked down, cowardly. I really hope that Zach's also doing okay now. I really couldn't find any recent updates. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Aura Flying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.